You're listening to the Sabina Road Baptist Sermon Series. We hope this message greatly impacts your life. For more information on the mission and ministries of Sabina Road Baptist Church in Tucson, Arizona, visit us online at sabinaroad.org. Joshua chapter 5, we'll be starting in verse 13 today. The title of today's message is The Lord Who Fights. You know, World War II, December 8, 1941, America officially declared war. Uh, USA, the United States, says... Uh, generally tried to avoid European conflicts whenever they happen and for as long as possible and usually get drawn in for a a variety of reasons. But um, uh, after the bombing at Pearl Harbor on December 8th, the United States says, we declare war. Just collectively from our leadership and, and, and for the most part, most of the United States citizens at that time realized there are things worth fighting for. And as believers, we face battles internally and externally. We face battles with our own flesh and our own uh, our own spirit, and they are battling, they are warring within our own hearts to do right and to do wrong. Uh, we face battles externally, things that uh, we we're Christians battle, the ideologies of this world that stand in stark contrast to the righteousness of God. And there are things worth fighting for. It's important to understand that people of faith achieve victory because the Lord fights for you. And so since this passage is is long, we're going to break it up into a variety of of sections. Um, But let's look at point number one, which is fighting on the right side. We see this in verses 13 through 15. Fighting on the right side. Point number one. So when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him, his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us? Are you for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped him and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals, for your feet, off from your feet, the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. That just seems like a good spot to pray. I know when you divide it up, it always is not as good up, uh, good divisions, but I always like to pray before I preach, if that's okay. Um, Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word. God, I pray that you would enliven and enlighten our minds and our hearts. Let you would speak to us. Let you would meet with us this very day. Love you and ask the saying in Jesus' name. Amen. Fighting on the right side. People are very passionate in our culture. Every time you turn on the news, there is a protest about something. I mean, every time they are, they are protesting about this, and then they're protesting about that there wasn't a protest. And uh, so there's always uh, something happening. You look at our news, there's, there's strikes happening. Uh, it seems like every other day people are passionate. But just because you're passionate doesn't mean that you're always right. It is said that Christians will be on the wrong side of history particularly with uh, our stance on marriage and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and gender identity, that we're told, oh, Christians are on the wrong side of history right now. That we, uh, in, a, in, in the future, we'll realize that 
that, uh, that we were wrong all along. And don't get me wrong, Christians have been on the wrong side of history sometimes. Uh, and particularly in certain branches that we they stood Christians stood against science and uh, and said we don't want to we don't want to follow through with that because we're afraid it's going to take away from God. Um, some Christians, or at least so-called Christians, stood in the way in support of slavery. They stood in the in a, a way against civil rights, and Christians were known as being on the wrong side of history. when Christians fight, they better make sure they're doing what God says. Are you with me, church? Yes. It doesn't matter what our culture says. It doesn't matter what your context says. It's what God says. So, so not spend a, a million years in the book of Joshua from the context. Remember, so, uh, so Israel has crossed over the Jordan River. And in that time, they had the men were circumcised of a certain age because uh, they stopped doing that while they were wandering in the desert. They had Passover in Canaan, and then manna stopped. That God had been providing for them for 40 years for manna, and then now that they are in the land that God has promised them, the manna stopped, and they're able to eat from the land that God has promised. So we see in our particular passage today that Joshua is scoping out the city uh, when he encounters a stranger. This is what a, a general, this is what the leader should be doing. Uh, they said, we're about to fight this battle. And so he's, we see him uh, in this passage. He's, he's looking uh, for maybe strengths, areas of, uh, of weakness, and he is ready uh, to bring his army against Jericho. So he encounters a stranger with a drawn sword. And Joshua asks a question that certainly makes sense. When you are in battle and you see somebody else you don't recognize for battle. And he's got his sword ready. And so Joshua asks a question that just makes sense. He said, hey, are you for us? Or are you against us? And Joshua, man, he ain't no coward. And because uh, I think Joshua was asked that question with his sword, with his hand on his sword. And Joshua was ready to go, man. For us? Are you against us? And then the man corrects Joshua. He says, no, 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 no. And he reveals who he really is. And Joshua falls down in worship. You see, this man says that I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now, there's a couple side notes we're going to do in this sermon, and here's one of them. Um, this is uh, likely the pre-incarnate Jesus. So if we say pre-incarnate, that means pre-in flesh. So before Jesus comes to earth and puts on a mortal body like us, he was alive. Jesus didn't begin in the New Testament. Jesus has always existed. And so he comes down and he is likely the commander of the army of the Lord. And the, and the, and the Old Testament talks about um, the, the angel of the Lord. And it's talking about Jesus in these passages. We know this from things that Jesus, this, this commander accepts worship. We know from Revelation that, that angels do not allow humans to worship them because only God is worthy of worship. We recognize that the angel of the Lord, the commander of, commander of the army of the Lord, completely disappears in the New Testament. So when Jesus comes on the scene, this commander mysteriously disappears. But he doesn't disappear. It's because it is Jesus. Amen. So Jesus is the commander of the army of the Lord. You see, Joshua was asking the wrong question. Are you for us or for our adversaries is the wrong question, although it is the natural question. I don't blame Joshua for asking it. I'm sure I would have asked it myself. The question that Joshua should not have been say, asking is not, God, are you on my side? But God, am I on your side? This is the question that we ask God, okay? Let's, let's reorient things. Not God, hey, this is what I'm going to do, and are you coming with me? That's the wrong question to ask. The question that we say is, God, you are God. How can I align myself with you? Am I with you? And this is exactly what Joshua does. The second he finds out who this guy is, he falls down on his knees and begins to worship this commandment. 
in the late 1400s, early 1500s, we have the Copernican Revolution. Right? And so in that time, uh, Copernicus realizes that the earth revolves around the sun. And before that, what did we believe? That the sun revolved around the earth. They call it the revolution because it changed the way a lot of things were thought of from that point on. As believers, we need to have a Copernican revolution in our heart, so to speak. So we have to ask this question, is God, God, am I revolving around you or am I expecting you to revolve around me? Now the funny thing is, is even if we wanted to, we can't make God revolve around us, but we like to think that we can. See, in this passage, we must learn that we are to align ourselves with God's plan, God's will, God's purposes. Your professor, your political party, your parents don't determine what is right. I'm giving it my best shot here, babe. I don't know what I know. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, you understand? Your professors in school, your political party, your parents, your parentage does not determine what is right and what is wrong, the plan that you have for your life. God and God alone sets those things. And so we align ourselves with this great God that we sing about. Not God, are you orbiting me, but am I circling around you? Am I, am I aligning myself with what you want me to do? We must learn to love the things that God loves. You know there's things that God loves. He loves it. He loves people. He loves souls. He loves righteousness. He loves justice. He loves mercy. And there are things that God hates. God despises. And so we must learn to hate the things that God hates. God hates injustice. You know that church? Hates he hates it when people are treated unfairly, who cannot stand up for themselves. We must learn to hate the things that God hates. Love the things that God loves. Value the things that God values. See, our culture talks a great deal about social justice, but God's concerned about something much bigger and more important than social justice. He's concerned about justice. He's concerned about justice. About treating people right by His standard and His way, things that He values. So we must check our heart regularly. You know why? Because the Bible says that our heart, the human heart, is desperately wicked. All these ridiculous love songs about follow your heart and being true to your heart are absurd scripturally. Because the Bible says that your heart is wicked. Desperately wicked. It doesn't know up from down. And you're going to trust that to lead you places? No, you don't want that. And so we must regularly check our hearts and say, God, do I value what you value? Am I spending time on what you care about? Am I wasting my life on things that the world cares about but you care nothing about and maybe you even stand against? So I encourage you, brothers and sisters, know God's Word. Know the God of the Word and submit yourself to it. That's what our world needs. People who know the principles of God, not their opinions, not their backgrounds, but they say, God, I know your Word and I'm standing on it. I know what you love, God. I know what you hate and that's what I'm centering my life around. I'm not asking God to center Himself around me. If your God never disagrees with you, then that's just an idealized version of yourself. Right? If your God never disagrees with you, it's not God. That's just an idealized version you have of yourself. And that's what many Americans' God is. Point number one. It's a really easy point. I know that you guys just love hearing that. I can tell by your faces. Y'all are just glad to hear that word. Amen? Right. We are making sure we are fighting on the right side. Yes, stand up for truth 
and righteousness and justice. Make sure you're fighting for the things that God cares about. Point number two. Allow the Lord to fight your battles. This is a long section, so we'll break it up in here in, in a couple sections. As believers, we are to allow the Lord to fight your battles. See, we all go through trials, we face conflict, and we fight battles. And we know scripturally that this is the way it should be for believers, that uh, difficult times produce character, and character produces hope. We know that difficult times refine us, make us useful to the Master, make us more and more like Jesus Christ. So look, at, look, look at me in these verses. We'll read verses 1 through 2 of chapter 6. We'll skip 8 and 12. Now Jericho was shut up in, inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its kings and mighty men of valor. Let's skip all the way down to verse 8. God's instructing Joshua, and then we see God, Joshua doing what God's instructed in verse 8. Just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of rams and horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord following them. The armed men were, were walking before the priests and were blowing the trumpets. And the rear guard was walking after the Ark while the trumpets blew continued. But Joshua commanded the people, You shall not shout or make your voice heard. Neither shall any word Go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. It's because the ark of the Lord has circled the city, going about it once, and they came to the camp and spent the night in the camp. You have to understand in, in ancient times that walls were a symbol of protection and strength. There's probably a word for our American culture there too, but uh, oh, what the, we still, we're still battling over walls right now, right? Uh, but the, uh, the walls were a symbol of protection and strength. Um, Jericho had a double ring of walls. The outer wall was 6 feet thick, and the inner was 12 feet thick. By most people's standards, was impenetrable, especially for Israel that had no siege engines. They had no battering rams. They had nothing that could bring down these walls. And so Israel was to march around the city one time for six days. And on the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. There were armed men in front, behind the Ark of the Covenant. And, they were, and it was carried by seven priests. God has an unorthodox way of approaching battles sometimes. Right? Uh, can you uh, imagine the, the people of Jericho? Now we know uh, from Rahab that the people of Jericho are absolutely terrified about what is happening. And uh, they, they've heard stories about this God. And if you can put yourself in their perspective, they're watching from their monstrous walls. And, and, uh, and then this, the city is shut up tight because they, maybe they even saw in the distance the Jordan River being piled up by this God of this foreign army. And this hot day, they are watching terrified uh, with bated breath as this army, this seemingly magical army, circles around their city. And they're praying to their heathen gods, hoping that they'll intervene. And they watch them circle their cities silent. They're watching this silent army circle. And then, right when you think maybe they might go to battle, then they all leave and go to camp. And they do it for several days in a row. Strange way that God fights that. Look at verse 15 with me. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. On that seventh time, when the priest had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. 
Only Rahab the prostitute and all who were with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep, keep yourself the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing of destruction and bring trouble upon it. There'll be more on that next week. But all silver and gold and every vessel of the every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. But the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard it, the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down. So that the people went up into the city, and every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys with the edge of the sword. But to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there, from there the woman and all who belonged to her, as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father, mother and brothers, and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron. They put to the treasury of the house of the Lord. Rahab the prostitute in her father's house, and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved the lot. She lived in Israel. To this day, she hid the message. To this day, because she hid the message, and Joshua sent out to spy out Jared. Before marching on the seventh day, Joshua instructed the people to spare Rahab, um, that they had uh, that there were things that are devo devoted to destruction. And, uh, and said there was a warning if you take any of these things then you are making Israel something that is devoted to destruction it was actually an act of worship to do what God said to do and after marching the people shouted blew the trumpets the wall came down and they saved Rahab and they burned the city and here's something also a side note worth paying attention uh, particularly if you're a young person this is time to stop looking at your phone and start paying attention here for a second okay yeah and so everybody's listening right now. We hear this attack on, on God all the time. This is a particular sections that are getting attacked all the time in universities. And that, that how could a God who is just command God to destroy, command the city to, to, to be destroyed? Now, I find it ironic that when people say, that, you know, look at the Holocaust. Why didn't God do something? And then when God did do something, they say, why did God do that? Right? Um, but this is a passage that atheists, the new atheist movement, which is the same old garbage it's always been, uh, says uh, that, that this is, this is, this is a, a flaw in your supposed God. But there's a couple things worth noting here. God has the right to end life. God has the right to end life. When you die, young, or if you die old, God has the right to end your life. God has supreme authority to do that however He wants to because He is good and He is just. It's important to understand in Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, we learn about um, the sins of the Amorites. This has happened hundreds of years before. And God says, uh, that, that he's not going to take Canaan over yet because their sins have not been complete yet. That God had been giving them hundreds of years to repent of the horrible, wicked that they were doing in these cities and they did not repent. He said the time of their judgment and the time of their sin is not yet complete. The sins of the Canaanites include a couple of these. Idolatry, incest, adultery, homosexuality, bestiality, and child sacrifice. And they had their god Molech, who was the god of the underworld, and they would bring their live babies, and they would put them in this bronze statue that they had fire within its belly of this statue. And they would put these little live babies in its arms, and they would burn it to death in sacrifice to their God. And, and one of their own historians said that uh, when the baby's faces began to melt, it looked like they smiled as their face shriveled up and fell into the belly of this false God. 
these people were evil. And God brought judgment on them. This is not God uh, 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 trying to, uh, to procure a nation, that, that, uh, trying to uh, propagate Israel. No, this was capital punishment by God. And God has every right to do this. So let's look at a, a little bit of application. I know on, on a, a very kind of difficult text. So letting God fight. So our biggest challenge fighting battles not battles is not circumstances, but moving aside so God can work. <clears throat> My last place I was at, I had several friends that were mechanics, and as I've told you before, I'm not a mechanic, and so I would say, hey, can you help me with this? And they'd say, sure, no problem. And, and so I'd go there, and, and at first I'd start there, you know, holding stuff and, 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 and trying to unscrew stuff and, and helping them teach me. But before I knew it, the, they had kind of moved me out of the way. The guy was just causing more problems, right? And so, uh, and so I had to learn to just step aside. When it comes to fighting our battles, you've got to learn to step aside and let God work. Philippians 3.3 3 says we put no confidence in the flesh. When trouble comes, we must learn to deny ourselves. Because usually when we do things on our own power, it leads to worry, it leads to hopelessness, it leads to doubt. And God's saying, you don't, you're going to have troubles, you're going to have difficulties, but you don't have to do it in such a way that you have to have it sin and worry and frustration in your life. Yes, fight these battles, but let me fight them for you. I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to lean into the promises of God. Trust His sovereignty. Trust that He is in control of all things. That He's not powerless. That He can do all things, but He does them in His plan and His timing and for His glory. So we learn to trust His sovereignty. We've got to learn to trust His timing, which is difficult. Amen? We're saying, God, heal this person. And God says, I may or may not, but I do it the way that I want to do it. And I do it when I want to do it because I have my plan. God, I need a new job. I'm having troubles with this. And, and uh, God says, trust my timing. Brothers and sisters, learn to trust God's love. Oh, when things are going bad, when things are going tough, understand that you have a God who loves you so much that He sent His Son to die for you. Learn to trust His love. See, we all face problems that seem insurmountable. Maybe some people in this room are dealing with depression. You're going through divorce. Maybe you're struggling with someone who has died. And these problems seem insurmountable. But so did Israel's problems. Crossing the Red Sea and crossing the Jordan and battling Jericho. These were insurmountable problems that they could not do by themselves. But they let God fight for them. And God, in His sovereignty, in His timing, and His love, He fought for His children. See, Christ is our advocate, brothers and sisters. I, I want to read two verses because this is important. And then we'll be closing up shop. So stay with me and listen to these verses. Christ is our advocate. 1 John 2, 1 says this. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says this. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Keeping that in mind, let's read Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 through 11. It says this. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come. For the accuser, this is talking about Satan, the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. That Satan is the accuser and that Jesus is our advocate. So in the holy courtroom of God that we stand and Satan who is the accuser says, Look, Father God, look what your children have done. 
They have, uh, they have blasphemed you. They've missed the mark. They've stood in things that you have said are wrong. They have broken your commandments. And they stand guilty. And if they stand guilty, then they are mine. And Jesus, our advocate, the one who fights for us, says, yes, that's true. Yes, they stand guilty. Yes, they've broken your commandments. But they are in me that my blood covers them. And so, yes, they were guilty. They are no longer guilty. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because they have trusted Christ, because they have trusted me, they stand innocent in my courtroom. There is no condemnation. And so when Satan accuses you, Jesus fights. When he tempts you to despair, Jesus fights. When he tempts you to quit, Jesus fights. When you're broken hearted, Jesus fights. When you're weak, Jesus fights. When you cannot fight for yourself, Jesus fights. He fought all of hell's darkness on the cross and he fought and he won and he fights for us every day before the throne of God. Our God fights. We all face that internally and externally. We have battles within. Oh, some battle depression, some battle substance, some battle addiction of some sort, and lust for the flesh, and lust for pride, and lust for power. We struggle with these things. The spirit is in us. Christ is in us, helping us fight those battles. We fight external battles of the world that stands against righteousness. But we fight. God fights. Battles that we cannot. See, people of faith achieve victory because the Lord fights for you. As we move into the invitation time today, this is the challenge of God's Word. Can I ask you first and foremost to check your heart. Ask God to help you understand what His statutes, His principles, His truths are. So Lord, help me to stand on the things that you love and stand against the things that you hate. What do you stand for? Do they line up the things that God stands for? If they don't, then you're wasting your time. And you're wasting your life. And I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to lay down your burdens for a God who fights for you. For a God who fights for you. Lay them down at God's feet. Lay them down at your Savior's feet. He fights for you. Yes, your, your child may be in rebellion. Maybe your, your husband or your wife doesn't know the Lord. Maybe you're going through some very difficult times. Understand, you can lay those burdens at the Savior's feet. You can lay them at the Master's feet. You don't have to carry those burdens. Your God fights for you. Allow Him to fight for you. He has all the power, all the ability to push you aside and say, no, 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 uh, I'm going to control things. But that's not the way that God works. God gives us freedom to allow Him to fight for us or us to uh, wallow in our own inability. Allow God to fight for you. Give Him your worry. Give Him your pain. Give Him your future. Give Him your relationships. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in His forgiveness. Praise God that we stand guilty before a holy God. And Jesus uh, stands as our advocate for Him. Spend a couple moments rejoicing. Share that with a friend this week. Friend, can I encourage you? If you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, there hasn't been a time in your life when you've turned from your sin, trusted him that you do stand guilty before a holy God and Jesus is not advocating for you because you have not allowed him to do so 
you're depending on you thinking you're a pretty good person or, or you, you've gone to church from time to time, think that that's going to make you right before holy God, you will stand guilty. All the Christians here are not perfect people. This is a declaration that we needed Jesus Christ. Amen. We've turned from our sins and we've trusted Jesus. Friend, if you haven't done that today, then, then when this music plays, come forward. Talk with me. Talk to one of your Christian friends. Fill it out one of the cards here in the chairs. Do not leave here unsure of where you will spend eternity. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Lord, thank you that you are our advocate. Oh Lord, we fail and we fail and we fail. We fail before we are believers and we fail after we are believers. But you advocate for us, Lord. You fight for us. You fight when we cannot fight for ourselves. So Lord, we praise you for that. We thank you for that. But I pray for those who are heavily burdened today, carrying guilt, shame, carrying the weight of problems that they cannot carry. Lord, I pray that they would thrust them on your mighty shoulders today. And they would receive peace that you've offered. I pray for those who do not know you, whether well, they would trust you as their Savior today. They would recognize that they stand guilty before you. And they trust Christ as their Savior today. It's not about church membership. It's not about baptism. It's not about giving money. But it's to really have a relationship with you. God, I pray that you would work in their hearts. Lord, help us to align ourselves with what you vow. We love you. And I ask you to sing in Jesus' name.